you awoke one morning greeted by this news. It sounds like a horror film, but this reality is closer than ever before. Since its inception, the state of Israel has been under attack by terrorist organizations whose brutal crimes have taken thousands of Israeli lives. Israel responds to these attacks, attempting to protect its citizens while striving to preserve its humanity by adhering to international law. It's a fact. According to international law, Israel is not a war criminal. But this reality may very well soon change. These groups are working on revising the laws of war to limit Israel's freedom of action and ability to defend its citizens and turn the state of Israel into a war criminal. What they can't achieve on the battlefield, they're trying to achieve in the legal arena. This has a name, lawfare. Changing the laws of war will restrain all democratic countries from combating the terrorist organizations that endanger their existence. But the terrorists, of course, won't change their methods. They'll continue using civilians as human shields and targeting civilian population centers. These changes in the law will place Israel in an impossible situation. If Israel acts, it will be deemed a war criminal. And if it doesn't, how can it be protected? And where will that lead? Criminal charges in domestic and international tribunals against Israeli soldiers. Economic boycotts. Abstaining from economic cooperation with Israel. We have to prevent this situation. That's precisely why we're here. Shoah Tadin works in various ways to deal with these issues. Organizing international conferences with leading world experts, bringing charges in the International Criminal Court in The Hague, defending Israel at international conferences and tribunals, public campaigns. Good afternoon and welcome to Surat Adin's virtual roundtable on the proposed plan by Israel to extend sovereignty over parts of Judea and Samaria, what some might call annexation. I am Nitzana Dorshan Leitner. I'm the president of Shurat Hadin Israel Law Center, an Israeli-based civil rights organization. Shurat Hadin has been a pioneer in the field of anti-terrorism litigation. Our lawsuits against terrorists and their leaders and financial supporters have resulted in hundreds of millions of dollars in judgments for terror victims in Israel in the United States and in jurisdictions around the world. Please visit our website at israellawcenter.org for more information. President Trump's proposed peace plan for Israel and the Palestinians has disrupted many of the previous efforts and understandings in the Middle East conflict and has introduced new ideas. Some find the changes to be bold alternative to failed ideas and policies. Others view it as radical and destabilizing. President Trump has recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital, moved the United States Embassy, and recognized Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Most notably, President Trump has proposed allowing Israel to annex portions of Judea and Samaria, while providing the Palestinians additional lands in the Negev Desert and a massive infusion of investment in the private Palestinian sector designed to lift the economy in areas under Palestinian control. President Trump's plan raises many questions and law of policy. Are biblical Judea and Samaria in fact rightfully part of the Jewish state? Which country or people have a legitimate claim to them? Can Israel legally annex Judea and Samaria under international law? What will be the political and policy ramifications of the proposed annexation? Must Israel grant citizenship to those non-citizens who live in areas to be annexed? We will explore this and other complex issues in the hour ahead. Our program will consist of three parts. We will first hear from Senator Ted Cruz. Senator Cruz, the junior senior from Texas, is a longtime friend of Shurat Hadin, who has been unwavering in his support of Shurat Hadin's mission to bankrupt terrorism one lawsuit at a time. Then I will interview Mr. Jason Greenblatt, President Trump's former special representative for international negotiations. 
Mr. Greenblatt has graciously agreed to answer questions which our viewers submitted for this online event. Finally, I will moderate a panel discussion between former ambassador of the United States to Israel, Dan Shapiro, Professor Alan Dershowitz, and former ambassador of Canada to Israel, Vivian Berkovici. It is my privilege now to present to you Senator Cruz. Good afternoon. I want to thank you all for inviting me to speak with you and for standing as a pillar for the United States and Israel. During the eight years I've been in the Senate, I have resolved to be Israel's strongest defender in the United States Senate. From urging the Trump administration to tear apart the catastrophic Obama-Iran nuclear deal, to leading the fight to move America's embassy to Jerusalem, the once and eternal capital of Israel, to pushing the administration to recognize the Golan Heights, to passing a bipartisan resolution in the Senate unequivocally condemning anti-Semitism. Every day for eight years, I have worked to strengthen the American-Israeli relationship and friendship and to combat anti-Semitism in every way we can. Earlier this year, the Trump administration introduced the Vision for Peace, which was another important step to undoing the sad legacy of the Obama administration and to rendering United Nations Security Council Resolution 2334 null and void. That resolution shamefully denied Israel's sovereignty over its territories, including the Jewish Quarter and the old city of Jerusalem. I was proud to stand with the Trump administration to further advance the cause of peace and to push our allies in the region closer together economically and diplomatically. As you all know, there is powerful virtue to clarity and to standing unshakably with our friends. I want to thank each of you for the work that you're doing to strengthen and to support the United States-Israel friendship relationship, and alliance. God bless you. Thank you, Senator Cruz, for sharing your insights and for your friendship to Surat Hadim. Next, I'm privileged to introduce Mr. Jason Greenblatt, the former White House Special Envoy to the Middle East. In this role, Greenblatt served as one of the chief architects of the Peace and Prosperity Plan between Israel and the Palestinians and between Israel and its Arab neighbors. While in office, Mr. Greenblatt was an outspoken critic of the tremendous anti-Israel bias at the UN. He emphasized Israel's absolute right to defend itself against Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad and criticized the UN for its failure to understand that a comprehensive resolution to the Arab-Israeli conflict will only come, if at all, through direct negotiations between the parties. Prior to joining the White House, Jason spent 20 years in senior positions at the Trump Organization. Jason remains involved working toward peace and prosperity throughout the Middle East region, focusing on creating what he calls a Middle East 2.0 by building economic bridges between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Welcome, Mr. Greenblatt. Hi, Nitsana. It's great to be here with you. Thank you for having me as a guest. Of course, it's great to see you, Jason. Um, and thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Um, you know, you were the one of the uh, chief architects of the peace plan, the uh, so-called deal of the century. Did you and your team really expect it to be uh, accepted by both Israel and the Palestinians? Yeah. So first of all, I don't like calling it the deal of the century. I know that's what so many people call it. It became a, a, a selling point for the Palestinians to use that term to trash the plan before it even came out. They eventually changed their title to the slap of the century and the shame of the century. So uh -huh. I try to call it a vision for peace. And I call it that really for your very question, which is we knew going into this, and certainly once we developed the plan, that nobody could put down a plan that everybody will accept. Nobody could put down a plan that both the Palestinian leadership 
and the Prime Minister of Israel would say, wow, you guys are so brilliant. How did you figure this out in a way that nobody before you could have figured out? And we understand that even within both societies, there's deep division over how this conflict can be resolved, if it can be resolved. So the answer is no, we didn't go in with any preconception that we would have immediate traction and excitement about the plan. Our goal was to put down a plan that we thought was realistic, we thought was implementable, and we thought both sides could get behind to at least negotiate in good faith to see if it's possible to finally get to the end of the road here. So uh, let's talk about the world reaction to the plan. What did you suspect the international reaction to be, say in Europe or the United Nations, even China? I'm not surprised at the reaction. Well, let me talk about the positive reaction and then we'll go to what is, was perfectly um, expected. We did have reasonable reaction from the Arab countries and in some cases, very positive reaction. I think it's historic that we actually had the United Arab Emirates, Oman, and Bahrain ambassadors at the launch of the peace plan. Clearly, as things have unfolded, there are things in that peace plan that they strongly disagree with. Uh, I won't use the word annexation, which is what everybody else calls it, but the application of Israeli right. law uh, or the extension of Israeli sovereignty. But despite the fact that that was in the plan, they were at the event and they applauded many times and they were warmly welcomed and they should be commended. Uh, there were other reactions from the region that were positive. There were reactions from certain countries in Europe and uh, certain countries in South America and probably in the Pacific area that were positive. But then we have the rest of the world who are stuck in the talking points of the decades from the past to believe that if you use the phrase two-state solution and you talk about three or four very high-level principles, most of which will never come to pass in my personal opinion, such as um, uh, pretending that East Jerusalem, including what the Muslims call Haram al-Sharif, what I call and I assume you call uh, the Temple Mount, uh, are part of or should be part of a Palestinian state. I don't think that will ever come to pass. Security arrangements that are, in, are inappropriate and unacceptable to Israel, I don't think those will ever come to pass. And they are just stuck and they think that they could say these things over and over and over again and that will lead to a peace agreement. In my opinion, that's never gonna happen. So the reaction in some cases was positive, and I think that was a, the result of three years of very hard work on the, you know, on the president's part, President Trump and Jared Kushner and myself and Avi Berkowitz, and in other cases, you know, no surprise. Right, I only can assume that the applauds from the, the representative of the Arab uh, states came after some type of preparation. Um, can you share with us what type of operation work did you undertake with Americans or Arab allies before announcing the plan? Sure. First of all, it took longer than I expected to release the plan. I had hoped it would be released within two years. It obviously took much longer than that. But as I've now had time to reflect uh, for months since my departure from the White House, I realized how each step of the process was so important to the eventual loss and one uh, release rather. And one main step was preparing the region for what we were trying to accomplish. We had to do a lot of education about the conflict. We had to listen, of course, to hear their philosophy and their thoughts. And in some cases, those were different than sometimes um, things that are said publicly. Uh, but I think we developed a very, very strong relationship with the region. I think that they respected the fact that we were earnest and sincere in our desire not only to bring about peace, but to help the Palestinians succeed with a better future. Uh, they clearly have a very different view of the conflict. They have a different view of what the solutions ought to be. But I feel um, I'm grateful to the leadership throughout the region for being willing to listen with uh, open eyes and open ears and um, listen to our ideas, give their thoughts beyond the standard talking points, and be willing to at least try to meet us in a direction as, so, as shown by some of the people showing up to this release, but meet us in a direction of trying to move the ball forward in as positive a way as possible on such a complicated and emotional and historical conflict. Right, right. You know, it's not a secret that the Palestinians were opposed to the plan even before it was revealed, uh, as you mentioned, and then from the 
very beginning. The Palestinians did not see it as a deal of the century, as you said. And uh, President Mahmoud Abbas even personally attacked you, labeling you as an extremist Jewish supporter of the settlement, claimed that you were heavily biased in Israel's favor. Um, were you disappointed? Well, I wasn't surprised, but yeah, I was disappointed in, in, in President Abbas, but not, not necessarily those around him. There are some who surround him who can never bring about peace. They, you know, they deceive, they manipulate, and um, they hurt the Palestinian people. I don't see President Abbas the same way. Um, I think that under the light, right political circumstances, which he doesn't have today, he might have been somebody who could have brought about something good. But he chose to cut the administration off after President Trump made his bold and courageous and historic announcement recognizing Jerusalem. And uh, he was unwilling from that point on to engage in any form of positive direction. And I agree with you that they trashed the plan before they saw it, they trashed it before they even knew what was in it. Um, their current prime minister made statements such as he believes the plan will be born dead. And every which way we signaled to them that we were still going to move forward with something that would allow Israel to move forward, to try to correct the record, to try to help the Palestinian people. And we weren't going to let them stop us with the normal rhetoric that they, off, that they always have used in the past. We reminded them that we would not be the first administration to fail. We would not be the first administration that they ignored or said no to. And uh, we recognize that and understand that, and we're unwilling to let them spoil potential progress for Israel, potential progress for Israel and its Arab neighbors, and equally importantly for the many, many Israeli citizens who live in Judea and Samaria, in what, I don't like using this word, in what others call settlements, what I call cities and neighborhoods, the Palestinian leadership, at least under the Trump administration, no longer has a veto card over what happens to the Israeli citizens. That is a decision that the Israeli government has to make, not the Palestinian government. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, Jews that live in Judea and Samaria. Um, were you surprised that many of the uh, Israel's right wing and many settlement leaders have a voice opposition to your plan, claiming that Israel should never create a Palestinian state? No, to go back to your first question, we understand that Israeli society is very uh, divided on this. I, I don't really have a sense of how many um, Israeli settler leaders are opposed to the plan. There are clearly one or two who are very vocal in the media. Um, mm -hmm. I think they, first of all, before anything, ought to be grateful to President Trump. I know they try to attack Jared Kushner. The things that President Trump and Jared have done, and together with the rest of the administration, Secretary Pompeo, my friend David Friedman, Ambassador David Friedman, and others, were incredible for the state of Israel. And to not acknowledge that and instead go on the attack, I think is really not appropriate. It's fine, of course, to disagree, and I understand their concern about a Palestinian state. But even that is a bit of an unfair criticism, because while we try to create a Palestinian state, every description in this very lengthy plan of how that state were, is supposed to operate, should address all of the concerns that those who are opposed to it have. And if they don't, we've always said, or at least I've always said, share your concerns with us the same way we tell the Palestinians so we could try to address them. I think we mm -hmm. put forth a Palestinian state that does not endanger Israel's security. We were very careful to be clear, and this is one of the biggest fights because they, you know, the Palestinians and their um, allies believe that this is, a, this is not a state, there's no sovereignty because Israel has overriding security control. That's critical to Israel's safety and security. We also gave Israel the ability to go back in. If they extend more and more abilities for the Palestinians to police their state, but then they fail. Either they fail because they can't do it properly or they fail because some new leadership comes up and wants to abrogate the agreement. Then the Israelis have the right to go back in and do what they need to do to protect their society without fear of the UN issuing all sorts of sanctions and condemnations for doing that. That is a critical component of the plan. If we didn't go far enough, I would love to hear from the settled leaders where we fell short and how we can improve it instead of them 
criticizing it without explaining what the criticism is. Right. That's, um, that's a challenge. Yes. Um, well, let's see. Let's see. Now it's, a, it's really open. If Israel goes forward, that's another question from the crowd, um, with its annexation effort, how do you believe the EU and other US allies will react? Do you believe Israel will face sanctions or diplomatic repercussions from the Europeans or the United Nations if it proceeds? Well, as I said in an op-ed I wrote recently, I hope they proceed with all some, whatever they think is appropriate of the application of Israeli sovereignty. I think it's time and I think that doing, not doing it is not gonna bring peace closer. I think that doing it finally shows the Palestinians that life moves on and we can't stay in limbo forever. Um, I do think we've seen the reaction from the world already that, you know, in terms of um, what people are saying. How effective they're going to be is very hard to predict because the European Union needs Israel for so many different things. You know, Israel is not um, a young nation anymore. Israel provides right. so much to the rest of the world, particularly with respect to security. And I think if the European Union does something drastic, they're going to regret it. Uh, that's not a threat, but they need Israel and they, um, they need to recognize that. And I think they'd be foolish not to recognize that. I think we will see a lot of discussion at the United Nations. I think under a President Trump, I'm not concerned um, at the Security Council level, but um, we will see a lot of nasty speeches, as we saw even during my time at the White House. And uh, I think that's just not only a waste of everybody's time, it doesn't bring Palestinians better lives and it doesn't bring peace closer. And if anything, I think it drives any hope of a peace process and eventual peace agreement much further behind. I think it's a foolish, foolish step for anybody to take any kind of sanction actions or anything like that. Glad to hear. Um, what will happen, you believe, to Israel's annexation efforts and your plan for peace if the Trump administration is replaced by a democratic administration in November? Uh, you know, a pharaoh comes that does not Joseph. Yeah. Look, uh, no, no secret, I'm a strong Trump supporter and I think he is uh, very likely to win, but it's a fair question. Uh, I think that President, um, a, a future administration will, a future democratic administration will um, put our plan aside, uh, will condemn the annexation, but I think they will come to realize that if they go back to the efforts of the past, they are wasting U.S. taxpayer money. They're wasting government time and energy because nothing is going to happen using the talking points and efforts of the past. I would encourage them to take our plan, sit with both sides. Maybe they'll have a lot more credibility with the Palestinians and work together with the two sides to try to, I don't want to use the term make it better because who knows what they'll do to it, but to try to work through it and not waste their time again, using the phrase two-state solution without explaining what that means and uh, trying to work on security plans like plans of the past that are not only not acceptable to Israel, but inappropriate to ask of Israel. No country should demand of any other country security measures that the country, a country like Israel in particular, that's been attacked from the, from the moment of its inception by war and terror attacks, can't accept the primary role of a government is to protect the safety of its citizens. Who are we, the United States or any other country to demand of Israel something that would, feel, that would make Israel feel insecure and Israel has the evidence for why it does feel insecure. So I am not optimistic uh, in terms of what might happen, but I think um, other than a lot of talking and rhetoric, not much is going to happen. Um, let's hope. You know, you have a long-term relationship with President Trump. What was it like working with a president when he was a private citizen and then transitioning into a new role in public office? Well, I would say I was lucky to have 23 years working for him. Uh, he's an amazing guy. He always behaved to me like a mensch. Uh, he was... Um, 
very on the ball, very hands-on, you know, always challenged me with difficult questions, but always, always willing to listen, always willing to think about the input that he was getting for me and others who worked with me and try to come up with um, solutions that might work in the situations that he was in. Um, you know, one of the questions I often get is his style of speech and Twitter are very different than mine. And that's absolutely true. But I feel like um, I know him better than how the media portrays him. I know him better than um, others portray him. And although we tweet differently and speak differently, I have great respect for him. I think he's done a great job over the last several years leading the country. And as I said, I hope that he is the next leader of the country again in November. Um, and uh, as far as the transition, you know, I was very fortunate because I had worked for him for 20 years. And uh, I also, you know, joined an administration where I knew people such as Jared. Uh, it was an easy transition. I was also very fortunate that the, um, the team that I was assigned from the National Security Council and the State Department to help us get through uh, this very, very challenging file was um, a very, very talented team, knew their material. They may, some of them may have disagreed with us politically and ideologically and on some of the solutions that we put forth, but they were always willing to work with us to try to get to a solution that made sense. So uh, it helped make the plan better to work with people like that who challenged us and gave us their view of how they saw the conflict and uh, it helped educate us. So I would say that uh, I was fortunate. Um, as an Orthodox Jew, I can ask you, uh, what was it like to be an Orthodox Jew in government and also in traveling the Arab world? So I was lucky throughout my career in New York City, being an Orthodox Jew and 20 years under President Trump was just not an issue whatsoever. In government, I would say I went in wondering how that would translate, but even there, you know, this administration has great respect for religion. I think the United States in general, um, under any administration has great respect for religion. So in Washington, there was no problem. Certainly in Israel, there was no problem. Uh, and I was, you know, so gratified to see that even in the Arab countries and even with the Palestinians, it was not a problem. There was at the beginning of our time, maybe even throughout our time, the, you know, sometimes people would write articles about, you know, why put three Orthodox Jews in charge of this file? What do they know? They're biased. How could you do that? <laughs> They're the wrong people. I would argue differently. I would say the fact that I'm a religious person actually enhanced my ability to work on this conflict because when I traveled through the Arab lands, uh, and again, including the Palestinian Authority, they were enormously respectful of my being observant. They made sure to the extent possible that I had what to eat. They, you know, if, if my tefillin, which I pray with every day, could tell stories of where I put on tefillin in the Arab countries, it would make an interesting book. Um, and it was never an issue. We understood each other because they value prayer and uh, their laws of dietary restrictions and family and so many other things the same way I do. So it was almost as if we were, um, and probably really are to some degree, family. So I would say it was um, a very easy thing. And, and I give the Arab um, countries and the Palestinians as well, uh, a great shout out for being so respectful to me. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Um, I would like to use this opportunity and ask you, are there any particular moments that stands out as memorable for you in your work? Maybe something behind the scenes or not so well known uh, that was in, you know, illuminating or fascinating experience for you? Probably the process for President Trump to recognize Jerusalem in December of 2017. So, of course, he made the promise, like all candidates do. He, you know, said it so many, so many times. Uh, but going from a promise to actualizing the promise is not really simple. Of course, a president can do what he wants in two seconds, but he did it in a very thoughtful way. He went through a very serious interagency process where everybody got to point out their thoughts. And of course, there were people who disagreed with it. There were people who said, as I'm sure they said in government over the years with prior presidents, that if we were to do that, um, and they you know, named all sorts of things that they thought might happen, I can't get into the details, 
but none of that came out. And that's why I give, uh, that and another reason is why I give President Trump so many, so much credit for following through with his promise. The other thing that surprised me is the amount of pressure that he came under from around the world about not fulfilling his promise and why he should not respect US law that really was a requirement, meaning the only reason not to respect this law, the Jerusalem Embassy Act, that our Congress passed in 1995 and was, was you know, not followed through with, was if the president felt that there was a national security reason not to follow through. I wasn't part of prior administrations, so I'm not passing judgment on them. I'm sure they did their own analysis and signed the waiver that they felt was appropriate at the time. But President Trump felt that the time had come not to sign that waiver. And you know, here we are two and a half years out and it was clearly a correct decision. But it was fascinating, troubling, disappointing, exciting, so many different things to watch that very extensive process inside our government and how the world was reacting both in the lead up and in the aftermath. And um, eventually being in Israel in May of 2018 at the embassy opening, which was really so, in it was moving when President Trump signed the proclamation where he declared Jerusalem the capital, but just being there. I remember calling my wife and kids after with uh, you know, tears in my eyes and a quivering voice, but it was equally amazing to be in uh, Jerusalem, Israel at the time in May of 2018 when the embassy was finally opened. Yeah, it was amazing. We all were there. Um, let me just um, finalize with um, what you do today. Um, we talked about um, Middle East 2.0, and maybe we can you can share some insights um, about the current state or security and geopolitical in the Middle East. Yeah, so first and foremost, what I do today is, uh, I, and, and the reason that I left the White House is I'm back to being a father and a husband. Um, thankfully, we have been healthy through this COVID pandemic, and yeah. uh, I've spent four months catching up on three years. So all six kids have been home uh, under lockdown with my wife and I, and you know, never in my 23-year or really probably 26-year career of working did I have the opportunity to have family dinner every single night? Usually just was reserved for Shabbat. So that has been a, yeah, that's been a tremendous blessing. You know, we go bike riding after dinner or swimming. And uh, I know I'll never have this opportunity again. So I'm, ter I'm enjoying that just uh, tremendously. And uh, business-wise, you know, I am continuing to work on efforts to connect Israel with its Arab neighbors. I still do speak to many, many Palestinians to see if we can figure out a road forward. But of course, ordinary Palestinians have no political power. So the conversations, while fascinating and interesting and important, uh, for the time being, are less likely to lead to something. Um, and I am spending time trying to connect Israel and the Gulf and other Arab countries uh, in terms of business and on different levels. It's challenging for a variety of reasons, primarily COVID. Uh, you know, business has slowed uh, across the board. People are interested in talking and uh, we hope for a good future in that front, but we have to be a bit patient until we see what the new normal is going to be. You know, you're lucky because Israel has opened up a bit. I know you have um, a little bit of a challenge again. Uh, yeah, second but, wave maybe. Yeah, hopefully <laughs> not, but I think, you know, it'll uh -huh. be instructive to, you know, countries in the region. Um, and, you know, I probably spend a portion of my day talking to people in the region about the conflict and most of the day talking to people in the region. Um, so what are the major obstacles to peace and security for Israel with the Palestinian and its Arab neighbors, just in general, now when you're still involved? So on the Palestinian side, I, I try to steer the conversation when I talk to people away from annexation, again, not my word, but we'll use it for this conversation. Settlements, again, not my word, because that is really not the reason there isn't peace. There was no peace before that. There was no peace before 67. Um, the, there, um, those issues have to be negotiated and resolved. I understand that, I acknowledge that, but we're not even there yet. First, let's talk about the divided house among the Palestinian leadership. You have a Palestinian leadership in Judea, Samaria, West Bank, whatever you want to call it, 
what should never be called occupied Palestinian territory because that's just a fabrication. But you have that leadership. And even in a perfect world, if President Abbas woke up today and said, you know what, I like the President Trump peace vision enough to talk to Prime Minister Netanyahu, what happens with the Palestinians in Gaza? How do we deal with the two million Palestinians who are suffering in Gaza, not because of Israel as much of the world tries to accuse Israel of, but because of the bloodthirsty terrorist thugs who are Iran funded in Gaza, who care nothing of the two million Palestinians there, but care deeply about destroying Israel. We have to figure that out. Nobody talks about that. They talk about how Israel is blockading Gaza and then they don't talk about why Israel has to take these security measures. And unless we, we start to talk seriously about that, none of these efforts are going to come to uh, any, anything meaningful. The second is the Palestinian authorities pay to slay program. If they're going to continue to pay Palestinians or encourage Palestinians to harm and kill Israelis, no peace is ever going to take hold. How would Israel sign a, a, a peace treaty with a government that doesn't value human life and is unwilling to um, strip away that type of hateful, um, heinous type of um, activity? Those are the precursors uh, to achieving peace. And yes, of course, at some point, we have to deal with the difficult issues. Is there a solution for Jerusalem? We think we came up with an appropriate solution. If it's not appropriate, let the Palestinians come up with something that isn't all of East Jerusalem, because that's just silly and unrealistic. Let them come up with something that could work for them. Um, the refugee issue, the so-called refugee issue. Uh, nobody in their right mind thinks that there's enough money today to compensate uh, First of all, it's multiple generations now. It's, you know, are there real refugees who had to flee? Yes. But the vast majority of these people are descendants who are kept in horrible camps for political purposes, who are used as political pawns, who absolutely deserve better lives. But the solution of pretending that somebody is going to write a big check to them, there are today over 70 million refugees around the world, legitimate current refugees. There isn't enough money. Um, in the world, this is pre-COVID, before the economic crisis, to help with these, these uh, people. We need to come up with a realistic solution to how to give these Palestinians better lives, whether or not a peace effort is going to be sustained and eventually uh, successful. Um, you know, border dispute. Yes, the land is disputed. I acknowledge that. And if Israel and the Palestinians together, without pressure from the European Union and the United Nations, can come up with a solution that's different than the one that we proposed, that's fantastic. But to suggest that, you know, it's going to be all of what people call the West Bank, you know, plus or minus a couple of percentage points, and Israel's going to evacuate tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of Israelis and mm -hmm. uh, face again what they faced when they evacuated Gaza. Who, who are we kidding? That's not going to happen. So I think one of the most important messages I could leave you with, and I, I think your audience is likely to be extremely well-versed in this conflict, but there are, you know, the rest of the world is not well-versed in this conflict. They hear the sound bites, they read thin, not detailed arguments or articles about the conflict. There has to be a massive education campaign about the real issues to achieving peace, the difficult issues to achieving peace, better versions of history, Israel is not going to convince the Palestinians that Israel's version of history is accurate. The Palestinians are not going to com um, convince the Israelis that it's accurate. But there has to be a, a way forward. And part of the way forward is to listen, to respect, and to try to come up with practical, realistic alternatives so that Israel no longer has to be in danger constantly and the Palestinians could have um, safe, respectful, dignified, prosperous lives just like Israelis. Is it possible? I don't know. Well, Jason, that was fascinating, enlightening, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm really amazed and happy and privileged, and thanks so, so much for you to join us and to enlighten us with these words. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity, and take care and stay safe. You too. Bye-bye.
We are now pleased to welcome former Ambassador Dan Shapiro, Professor Ellen Dershowitz, and former Ambassador Vivian Berkovici. Dan Shapiro was the Ambassador of the United States to Israel from 2011 until 2017. During that time, he was instrumental in maintaining the close relationship between the United States and Israel. Upon completing his term as an ambassador, Mr. Shapiro became a distinguished visiting fellow at the Institute for National Security Studies at Tel Aviv University. Welcome, Mr. Shapiro. Alan Dershowitz was a Felix Frankfurter Professor of Law at Harvard Law School until his retirement in 2013. A renowned litigator and respected scholar Professor Dershowitz is an expert on constitutional and international law. Good to see you, Professor Dershowitz. Thank you. And in 2014, upon the recommendation of then Prime Minister Stephen Harper, Queen Elizabeth II commissioned Vivian Berkovici as Canada's ambassador to Israel, a position which she held until 2016. Prior to entering Canada's diplomatic service, Ambassador Berkovici practiced law in Toronto for 24 years and taught as a professor at the University of Toronto Faculty of Law. Great to see you, Vivian. Great to be here. Thank you. So welcome all, Ambassador Shapiro, Professor Dershowitz, and Ambassador Berkovici. And um, then I would like to start with you. Um, Jason Greenberg was the uh, architect, one of the architects of the peace plan. Uh, what's your initial remarks on his words? Thank you, Nitsana, and uh, it's good to be with you and your Shirat Adin audience and Professor Dershowitz, Dershowitz and Ambassador Berkovich, uh, good friends and colleagues all. Uh, and it was important also to hear uh, Jason Greenblatt's uh, description of his work and the administration's uh, plan. Um, I'll say a couple of things up front. One is that uh, I know Sharat Adin is very much of an organization focused on issues of law, uh, and there's a dispute among uh, that is being played out in commentaries on the plan about whether or on the end uh, the, the, uh, the next move by the Israeli government, whether it's annexation or whether it's applying sovereignty. I'm not a lawyer, unlike uh, unlike Professor Dershowitz. I won't make a legal case. Um, I think uh, those are essentially semantic arguments over what is the same thing, what is being proposed, which would be a unilateral act by uh, Israel to determine uh, the status of territories that are uh, subject to dispute. Uh, there was a long time when we had an argument about whether uh, it should say occupied territories or disputed territories. But one thing that was uh, always drilled into my head by many Israelis, as well as uh, uh, you know, several previous American administrations, uh, is that uh, the outcome of those uh, territories should be decided through uh, uh, bilateral negotiations between two sides uh, rather than unilateral acts. So uh, that's uh, uh, that I think, I don't think we, we, can, we would disagree on that, although I, I don't want to speak for others. I think that's uh, why I don't make much of a distinction between the terminology. I'll use unilateral annexation. Uh, the second thing I would say is that uh, I have concerns about it because of the U.S. interests that I believe would be uh, harmed uh, by uh, this, uh, the plan as it's uh, arranged and by the, uh, the unilateral annexation that it seems to be uh, uh, facilitating. Uh, the interests are, of course, very much bound up with Israel's security, a fundamental uh, strategic as well as moral interest for the United States. That's why uh, on a bipartisan basis, administrations and Congresses and the American people support strong U.S. assistance to Israel and uh, ensuring Israel's right of, right of self-defense. Uh, but what is very likely to happen, and uh, I don't uh, expect some sort of immediate explosion of violence, the bigger concern I have uh, after a unilateral annexation is that over time, uh, it will make it uh, much less viable for any uh, functional Palestinian authority to exist on the areas that remain uh, in the non-annex portions. The, the, the rationale, the raison d'etre of that authority uh, or at least the logic of it being a, a, a stepping stone toward uh, the government of an independent state will really be hard to sustain as, a, as a, uh, a legitimate case by Palestinian leaders to their own people. Uh, and so over time, as that authority withdraws and maybe disappears and the security cooperation, the very effective security cooperation that 
uh, goes on uh, between Israel and the Palestinian Authority that poses great risk to the security of everybody. So does the potential for uh, destabilization in Jordan. I don't think we should take that as uh, at face value. On the other hand, Jordan is a linchpin uh, of security for the entire region, it helps the United States manage uh, things like Syria and ISIS and Iraq, as well as being a good security partner to Jordan. And the King of Jordan, a close ally, is uh, warning us that this is something that could be very difficult for him to continue uh, as he has. And I think we should at least we should at least take that seriously. So those are the, some of the U.S. interests that I'm concerned about. And again, I see them as somewhat at odds with uh, principles uh, that were designed to help foster those interests and Israeli interests, common interests that we share, uh, that were the basis of much of the work we did over many years. One was that there should be no unilateral uh, steps uh, to determine the outcome. That's, of course, why we oppose Palestinian unilateral steps at the ICC or declarations of independence and the like. But you know, annexation clearly falls into that category. Uh, two, uh, I would say precisely because of the risk and fear that once the Palestinian Authority breaks down and security cooperation breaks down, Israel gets drawn inexorably back into control of the entire uh, West Bank and all of the people who live there. Uh, and that brings it into the category of kind of a binational state controlling roughly equivalent Jewish and, and Arab populations. And that puts major pressure on its Jewish and democratic identity. Those are the core elements of the joint values between the United States and Israel, which is the basis of the security partnership. That was something else Prime Minister Netanyahu told me many, many times he wanted to avoid uh, at all costs was uh, a binational state. Um, and in fact, uh, that there were answers to all of those needs, the security needs, and of course, Israel maintaining a, its Jewish and democratic identity and finding ways for Palestinians once they are able to make decisions they haven't made yet and tell hard truths to their people they haven't told yet uh, to achieve their legitimate aspirations and rights for self-determination to stay their own. Those were the, the, the basic principles of, of, of previous efforts. I'll pause there. Well, thank you. Um... Vivian, Canadians are known as um, trying to be neutral, uh, especially when it comes to international conflicts. Um, do you believe that the uh, Trump peace deal was fair to both parties, Israelis and Palestinians? Um, so I'm wearing my Canadian hat tonight then, not my Israeli hat, am I? Okay. I am. Um, so far. Yeah, absolutely, happy to do that. Um, Look, the, the Canadian role traditionally, kind of the post-war role, has been the honest broker. Uh, and that's um, a tagline that the current Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, likes to use often. We're going to get back to our honest broker role, and particularly when he's speaking about the Middle East. Suggesting, of course, that Prime Minister Harper was not an honest broker. Um, and Canadians do like to see themselves as being fair, even-handed. And I think that overall, uh, that's how Canadians have behaved globally, geopolitically, since World War II. So that's the Canadian part. But your real question to me at this point was, do I think the Trump deal is fair to both sides? The both sides being, of course, the Israelis on the one hand and the Palestinians on the other. Um, I think that the Trump initiative slash proposal uh, is no less fair than previous proposals. And I go back to Oslo for that. And the reason I say that is that it may have been communicated in stronger, some say more heavy handed language, but at the end of the day, the proposal says to the Palestinians, come to the table now because you're running out of time. And if you don't, we're not going to object to Israel um, implementing, executing some form of annexation. So they're, they're, what the Trump, the Trump proposal does that's different, I think, is it signals very strongly to the Palestinians and Palestinian leadership that you have to step up. We cannot let this go on forever. 50 plus years is too long already. And you have to take responsibility. Um, again, it's great to be with uh, these, this excellent panel, and I know that Professor Dershowitz has to run in a few minutes, so I'm going to wrap just on this point uh, that Dan made that I think is very important. Um, I don't think anyone wants unilateral action. That's clearly not favorable. Having said that, 
you know, I think that uh, Israel right now is very much between a rock and a hard place for a change. Um, and one thing I think even Prime Minister Trudeau would agree with me on is that the current Palestinian leadership is not terribly functional. Um, and, you know, Dan spoke about, um, we don't want to see the situation deteriorate further where there is, you know, dysfunctional leadership uh, with, with the greatest respect, I suggest that there's functional leadership only with respect to security, and that's only because it suits the Palestinians' interests as well. It's in their interest to have security cooperation as much as with the Israelis. Other than that, I don't see much in the way of functional leadership, certainly not in uh, Gaza, but I wouldn't uh, use that term to describe the PA. And with that, I'll pass the mic over. <laughs> <laughs> um. Alan, as a lawyer, I have so many questions to you, um, but perhaps I will just start uh, with your uh, initial assumption about the status legal of, the, uh, of Judea and Samaria. Are they occupied? Are they not? Are they held? I'm not a big believer in the uh, strength of uh, international law. International law is mostly decided by academics in ivory towers who don't have a lot of uh, experience on the ground. It was Dean Acheson who once said, no country's future will ever be determined by law. Law is a factor, but it is not a dominant factor. The decisions and the peace process in the Middle East will not be decided based on whether or not the occupation is called an occupation, whether it's legal or illegal, whether uh, the views of, um, of uh, uh, Dean Rostow of the Yale Law School, who said that the occupation was entirely lawful, or Yudhu Bloom, who said the same thing, prevail over other views. Those are interesting debates to have in classrooms, but no uh, outcome is gonna be dependent on that. What will determine the outcome is actions on the ground. Uh, I think we all agree here on this panel that uh, we would prefer bilateral negotiations between Israel and the Palestinian Authority, or Palestinian leadership, that we oppose generally unilateral actions. But let's remember the most important unilateral action taken in the last many years was taken by the Obama administration uh, improperly when they engineered, and I use the term advisedly, and I know I'll hear some pushback from the former ambassador, but I know for a fact that Barack Obama, who I know was a student and who I knew well and who I voted for, and who I advised on the Middle East, and who I advised on Iran. I know for a fact that he engineered the Security Council resolution at the very end of his term that unilaterally declared the Kotel, the Western Wall, the access road to Hebrew University, the access road to Hadassah Hospital, the Jewish Quarter, to be a flagrant violation of international law. There could be no more destructive unilateral act than that committed by my former friend, Barack Obama. Uh, I broke off my personal relationship with him over that issue. I thought that was such an outrageous act of revenge. He didn't have the support of his own people in the administration. I doubt he had the support of the ambassador. Uh, I know he had no support in Congress to speak of, no support by the American people. But he took a unilateral act, unilateral act of revenge against Benjamin Netanyahu, who he despised, as he was leaving office in an effort to tie the hands of the incoming president. So if we talk about unilateral, let's start by putting the blame squarely where it belongs. Um, having gotten that out of my system, and I'm anxious to hear whether the ambassador will acknowledge what I suspect is the truth, that he was not thrilled about this Security Council abstention. I know that the person who actually made the abstention, uh, Samantha Power, another one of my former students, could not have been thrilled by that. If you look at her original speech, clearly it was a speech written to veto. And then at the last minute, she obviously got the instruction to abstain and not veto. I know also that um, uh, New Zealand and other countries, Egypt, we're not in favor of pushing it, and the United States pushed it very, very hard. So 
Let's put that behind us. But I don't want to hear any lectures from Obama people and the Obama administration and Obama himself about unilateral action. We all prefer bilateral action. So Israel accepted a two-state solution in 1937, 1938, 1948. Um, I think the Oslo Accords implicitly do that. Uh, obviously, 2000, 2001, 2008, the unilateral withdrawal from Gaza in 2005, the Palestinians refused to accept any of those. And the question is, what do you do when the Palestinians won't sit down and even come to the negotiating table about a plan that would result in a two-state solution? I think the brilliance of the plan, I have to admit, I did play a small role. I was in the White House with uh, Mr. Greenblatt and Mr. Kushner and and Mr. Berkowitz and others for a couple of days going over the plan back a few years ago. I think the brilliance of the plan is that it tried to avoid conclusory words. And I would love the debate to continue without using the word annexation, without using the word occupation, without necessarily even using the word Palestinian state. Um, I think we should focus on facts on the ground. Um, the word, Annexation is a, is a loaded word. It's a, it's a word of dynamite. It's a word that's designed to push people apart. But when you think about what's actually at stake here, and that is whether Israeli law, with all of its basic protections, fundamental safeguards, should be applied to areas which we all know will ultimately become, largely will become part of Israel. How do I know that? Because President Abbas told me that. Uh, I met with him. Uh, just before he met with President Trump. We had a nice conversation, just a half a dozen of us, in a home uh, with Saeed Barakat. And he acknowledged that, of course, Malaya Dumim and Gilo and Efrat and uh, Kikar Etzion and all of those areas will remain part of Israel in any settlement. And so the question is whether Israeli law should apply. It would be much better if that were negotiated, if that were done as part of a negotiation. It's also very clear that the Jordan Valley will remain under the military control of Israel for an indefinite period of time, whether you use the term annexation or not. And remember, too, under international law, and I don't like to quote international law, but since it was asked about a military occupation, put aside civilians, a military occupation is perfectly lawful until all belligerency ends. And I don't think anybody can say that all belligerency has ended on the West Bank, certainly not on the Gaza. And so a military occupation of the Jordan Valley is permissible under international law. I agree that settlement activity is, raises a very, very, very different issue. And so if we can eliminate uh, those terms and, and start focusing on what's really at stake, and the three things that are at stake in the plan are application of Israeli law to areas that will ultimately become part of Israel. 97% of the occupants of that area are Israelis. The Palestinians who live in those areas will be given a choice to become Israeli citizens or to move to areas which are under Palestinian uh, control and probably be compensated for uh, that move. So that's one issue. The second issue, obviously, is the, the Jordan Valley. And the third issue is, um, is Jerusalem, a united Jerusalem under Israeli sovereignty with a Palestinian state uh, in something that the Palestinians can regard as part of uh, Jerusalem. I think those are the issues that ought to be debated without using the words annexation, occupation, or state. My own hope, I have advocated a two-state solution since 1968. I was the first Jewish leader to call for a Palestinian state. I was condemned. I was the first major Jewish leader to oppose Israeli settlements in, in Elan Moreh, front page story in the New York Times. My rabbi, my Orthodox rabbi, called me a traitor to the Jewish people for opposing an Orthodox settlement in Elan Moreh. So I come with strong credentials as a moderate favoring a two-state solution. But I do not favor uh, the Israelis doing anything to endanger their security without the Palestinians coming to the table. And I support Benjamin Netanyahu's statement that painful compromises will be required on both parts. The Israelis have indicated a willingness to make painful compromises. If there's negotiation, there will be more painful compromises. The Palestinians must have compromises. They must compromise their so-called right of return. 
the effort to bring millions of descendants and relatives of people, some of whom were forced out, some of whom left voluntarily, back to help delegitimate Israel demographically, that has to be compromised. So the hope, I agree with the ambassador from Canada, I think the goal of the peace plan was to bring the Palestinians to the table. If that fails, I think everybody then has to be asked, what's the option? What is the option if they won't come to the table? The option is essentially preservation of the status quo. And I think if you take away labels, the plan that is now on the table comes very close to preserving the on the ground status quo. So uh, then Alan just asked me a question, if you are in favor or not in favor of the Security Council uh, resolution by the uh, President Obama, uh, if you can relate to this, but um, also about what you predict will be the uh, um, reaction of the world um, talking about China, talking about the Arab world and the Palestinians themselves uh, for the peace, uh, for the annexation. Sorry, Alan, I must use this word. I don't have another word to use. Okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> right now. Application of Jewish law is the other term uh, of Israeli okay, law. Okay, of Israeli law. That's okay. true. And, um, and we'll be, you know, we'll be another intifada with the Palestinians. Uh, we'll go outbreak with another wave of violence. Uh, well, so thanks. I don't think it's uh, the most productive use of this uh, forum or pretty much any forum these days to uh, rehash the debate about uh, Resolution 2334. I'll say a couple of words on it since it was raised. Uh, I'm on record publicly saying that I had recommend a veto, recommended a veto of that resolution. Uh, I didn't think it accomplished uh, well, very much. There you much. go, Alan. <laughs> uh, Good. I, I, uh, having said that, uh, several things that uh, Professor Dershowitz said about it are, are, are that whole episode are, are just completely incorrect. Uh, nobody has, uh, many people have claimed uh, that the United States was the active drafter and initiator and force behind the resolution. That's nonsense. Nobody has ever presented any evidence for it because there is no evidence for it. This was a Palestinian resolution that we knew, of course, they might offer. Uh, and uh, they had friends on the council who were prepared to offer it. And then when the time came to make a, to, to cast a vote on it, the president uh, made a judgment call. I would have made the, a different judgment call. His judgment call was based on trying to uh, ensure that the United States not seem to give a signal of assent to what was at the time a very active campaign in Israel to uh, legalize settlements that had been uh, deemed illegal by the Israeli Supreme Court. Uh, because he's concerned, he, he maintains a concern which I share very much uh, about uh, the expansion of settlements, making a two-state solution and keeping Israel a Jewish and democratic state, and that common values partner of the United States, uh, impossible over time. That was his judgment call. I would have made the other judgment call, but the description of the effects of this resolution are wildly overstated. Uh, it uh, basically restated uh, a longstanding international principle. Uh, which appears in many previous UN Security Council resolutions under uh, the Bush and Reagan and other Bush and Clinton administrations, which simply says that changes to the, the, the 1960s law, seven lines will be recognized as a result of negotiations, uh, not as the result of unilateral acts. So that is uh, all I really think I want to say to extend that debate, but it does touch your, the rest of your question. Uh, which is that that principle that changes to the borders uh, will be recognized internationally by uh, as only as a result of your negotiations, not as a unilateral act, I think very much goes to the uh, answer to your question. Uh, at the moment, there seems to be one international actor who might recognize uh, Israel's uh, sovereignty in the areas it will annex or apply its law to, uh, and that's the United States under the Trump administration. Uh, I doubt one could find a second government anywhere in the world uh, that will do that. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, people will take punitive actions. I certainly hope uh, that's not the path we go down. Arab states that have been working on uh, a slow and gradual process of normalization with Israel uh, may slow it. So that was what the UAE ambassador uh, said in a paper, in an, uh, a, uh, uh, an op-ed he posted, he wrote in Hebrew in an Israeli newspaper. Of course, the UAE has sent other signals even today. Uh, by continuing to do uh, practical cooperation with Israel on technology and security and, and, and COVID. Uh, but uh, that's one area where there could be a, an effect. Uh, we've talked about Jordan. I think the Jordanians have been very 
uh, outspoken about their opposition to this. And it's an incredibly sensitive issue within Jordan with their uh, large Palestinian majority uh, population. Um, so uh, I don't expect uh, uh, that's going to improve Israeli-Jordanian relations. And again, anything that would destabilize Jordan is something that would have negative impact on, on a lot of interests. Europeans have uh, indicated all sorts of different things. Some are, they're generally opposed. So some have said there would be uh, punitive measures. Some have said, no, they would block punitive measures by the EU. Uh, I think it'll be a mixed bag. What I don't think is that there will be any uh, international legitimacy granted uh, to uh, those unilateral uh, acts, uh, which we'll call annexation. But again, it's, it amounts to the same thing. Uh, and I think we should also bear in mind that uh, the impact that this could have on the bipartisan consensus around, about Israel in the United States. That is a, a strategic asset to Israel. That is a fundamental basis of uh, the relationship that allows us to have this enduring security partnership that's really grounded in the common values we share over uh, ye decade, years and decades. Uh, and it uh, survives ups and downs and it survives different presidents and prime ministers and it survives changes of party in both countries and really only gets stronger. The President Obama, uh, who a moment ago was accused of holding all kinds of personal grudges against Prime Minister Netanyahu, extended that agreement very strongly with the, the $38 billion uh, MOU that was signed at the end, not, not the act of someone looking for vengeance uh, against, a, against a partner. He, he believed and believed then and believes now very strongly in that partnership. However, I think one should not, one can't ignore uh, that uh, there is a consensus view within the Democratic Party. It's being voiced uh, by the party's nominee, by all the main congressional leaders, including uh, the most uh, supportive members of Congress uh, historically for Israel, people like Steny Hoyer and Nita Lowy and Ted Deutsch and Chuck Schumer. Today, 191 uh, Democratic members of Congress have signed a letter uh, uh, stating their opposition to annexation and stating it on the basis of how they feel it will affect U.S. interests, how they will affect the, the perception of Israel as a common values partner uh, based on uh, the, the shared uh, democratic values and Israel as is a Jewish and democratic state, which is clearly going to become harder and harder to maintain as Israel expands control into more and more of the West Bank. Yes, initially into areas that are mostly uh, Israeli uh, population, but if a Palestinian authority cannot sustain itself and if that security partnership uh, with the Palestinian Authority uh, weakens and Israel is uh, put in a position where it has it gets pulled into taking uh, full responsibility for all the territory and all the population in the West Bank, that will really raise serious questions for Israel and create that binational state dynamic that the Prime Minister himself has often talked about trying to prevent. And it certainly will raise questions about its Jewish and democratic character. So when I'll just close with this. When uh, it is, of course, true that uh, the current administration uh, sets policy for the United States, uh, no one would it would would possibly question that. But you know, we're a few months, soon a few weeks from an American election, a very competitive election. Um, when one entire party, uh, including the best friends of Israel in that party, in our two-party system, uh, are telling Israel in the spirit of friendship. Uh, this is something we think is harmful. This is something that will be very difficult for us to defend. And this is something uh, that, uh, you know, we oppose. Uh, and for Israel to proceed anyway and do that, I think makes a bit of a mockery of the claim to value bipartisan consensus in, about the U.S. Israel relationship. Can I ask a quick question of the ambassador? So what would you do? Um, here we have a situation where Israel de facto controls these areas. Israel de facto controls the Jordan Valley. The Palestinians won't sit down. They turned down 2000, 2001. They turned down Ayat Omer in 2008. You're the now the prime minister of Israel. You want to maintain a bipartisan relationship. What do you do? What do you do? You maintain the status quo. Uh, that's less provocative, but from the point of view of the Palestinians, it's not very much different. So what do you do? What's your suggestion as an alternative, because I'm looking for an alternative. I don't like, as I say, the term annexation. What would you do? Well, the idea that the only option uh, is to maintain the status quo or give up on the status quo and unilaterally determine a new status, uh, I don't think is, is the only well, way one is, could think about it. What but, is clearly, look, but clearly, uh, all of the demands that have been made of Palestinians in previous negotiations and that they have not met uh, sometimes by not showing up and sometimes by showing up and walking away and sometimes by 
uh, refusing uh, to tell the difficult truths to their own people about there isn't going to be a right of return, about the legitimacy of a Jewish state uh, in the historic homeland of the Jewish people, about the illegitimacy of violence and the terrible payments that are made uh, to terrorists, about Israel's very legitimate security needs. All of that has to be addressed. There's absolutely no uh, question that- uh, How do you address What do you do? Well, I, I, one thing- uh, I'd like to offer a solution. Yeah, I'll give you one, just a second. In a second. Uh, just, I don't expect it to happen under the current Israeli and Palestinian leaders. I think the, the complete mistrust between them, I think their respective political positions, the point at which they are in their political careers makes that very unlikely. Uh, what I do think is it's very important to keep that notion alive and to keep it viable. It will take changes of leaders. It will take a different Palestinian leader who will tell some of those hard truths. But the odds of such a leader arising seems to me a bit higher if at least the viable uh, two states is still available and possible to be achieved than if it is essentially made unilaterally impossible uh, by any uh, stretch of the imagination, which is what where this plan leads. Vivian, your uh, comments? Yeah, I'd like to jump in here and suggest that this uh, moment really creates a very, very perfect opportunity for the UAE to use their influence and to convince their um, Arab nation, the other Arab nations in the region to use their influence to do something constructive. So don't come out and, you know, we've all read the editorial that was in Hebrew and it was also in English and um, several UAE, prominent UAE officials, the foreign minister and pardon me, the UAE ambassador to the US have, you know, broken new ground, written, communicated directly with the Israeli people, written directly to the Israeli people, gone to speak to the American Jewish community, committee. And what they've said is, you know, it's a lot of finger wagging still at Israel. Be careful, because if you do this, all of this progress that we've made, it's going to go out the window. Well, I'd suggest that they sort of recalibrate a little and look at it somewhat differently. I'd suggest they start wagging their finger much more at Abbas and at Hamas and get them to the table and help them to understand that there's no more to ask of Israel. There's no further that Israel can go. I'm all for the keep hope alive and keep the dream alive approach. I really am. I think it's great. But I also think we have to be pragmatic. And we have to look at what's in Israel's interest. And is it in Israel's interest to prolong this agony? Where does it get us? Why can Abbas not get to the table? Because he chooses not to. And if he was made to feel some pain and pressure financially, and diplomatically from the UAE, from Saudi, if Hamas was made to feel the same kind of pain and pressure from Qatar, then the Palestinians might see that it really is in their interest to finally get to the table. But if their dream of the right of return is never quashed, if their dream of taking over Jerusalem is never quashed, then they're not going to come to the table. So as opposed to, I, I, I agree with so much of what has been said. I hate the annexation thing, the talk of it, because right away it creates this paradigm in everyone's head of South Africa, right? If we annex, we're gonna have this forced uh, segregation and it's just gonna be a disaster. And, um, you know, it's not a winner politically the way it's currently being discussed and presented. Fine, America, use your influence, get the UAE to the table, to get mm -hmm. the UAE to, uh, to push, to uh, do whatever they have to do to, to twist the PA's arm to get to the table and let's get this done. And the other thing I think is very important is the whole discussion around the two state solution has changed. The way in which Robin spoke of the two states under Oslo is not the way in which the PA and others talk about two states today. You know, the two state solution today seems to envision complete um, and total sovereignty, equality, um, perhaps a military capability. And that's just never, ever been conceived by any Israeli officials from the left to the right. Um, but somehow in discussions internationally and in international forums, there's been this kind of creep, this continuum. Creep yeah. in the discussion. 
So, the, so you know, all of a sudden we're talking about these two sovereign, completely equal states. No, that's absolutely never going to fly for the reasons that I think all three of us agree on, all four of us, the pragmatic security um, issues with which Israel must contend and will always have to contend. You know, you're absolutely right. Can I just quickly quote Rabin in 1995? Quote, the Palestinians would have less than a state. Israel would retain security control over the Jordan Valley in the broadest yep. meaning of that. Jerusalem would remain united under Israel's sovereignty and settlement blocks in Judea and Samaria would become part of Israel. That was Rabin just months before he was yep. assassinated. Too pro-Palestinian, too pro-peace. You're absolutely right. The, and, and, and you cannot reward That's what I say to my kids all the time. But you cannot reward the Palestinians for saying no. You cannot give them more. Absolutely. No, Ayod Omer was a good friend of mine. I love him. But I think he made a terrible mistake when he offered the Palestinians more in 2008 than they had rejected in 2000 and 2001. I think you always offer slightly less after a rejection rather than slightly more, even if it's only symbolic. You do not reward no, you do not reward intifadas, and you do not make decisions based on threats of intifadas. Absolutely. And I think that, Nitsana, just to circle back to your opener to me, you know, the fair Canadian, um, thank you for that. The, um, you know, th that's what this Trump plan does, is it just kind of says there's a line, guys. There's a line. And we're not going to keep, you know, throwing catnip at you. We're not going to keep feeding the dream. And, and um, you know, the right of return being a huge, huge one. We're going to say, you know what, you've got to step up or the party's over. Party I use metaphorically, of course. So Vivian, um, you live here in Israel. So I would I like to use, use your Israeli hat now. Were you surprised by the objection of uh, the right wing faction in Israel to the annexation plan? Oh, nothing surprises me. <laughs> um, <laughs> am I surprised by that? No, I'm surprised by lots of other things. Um, I not only live here, I made Aliyah. So uh, I can legit speak with, you know, from two, I, I, I have dual nationality now. Right. Um, obviously I did not when I was serving uh, as ambassador. Um, no, I was not surprised at all. I mean, a lot of these people I know personally, I've uh, had the pleasure of meeting with them and discussing these issues. Um, but, you know, there are uh, there there is a very vocal group that rejects it. There are others who accept the basic tenets of the Trump proposal. Were you surprised? I mean, yeah. there's always going to be look, it's a country full of Jews. There's always going to be someone who's not going to like something. So, no, I wasn't surprised at all. I, I can't then, say um, much more than that. Okay. <laughs> then I just want to go back to your um uh, words about the uh, Democratic Party in uh, in United States. Uh, do you think there will be a change uh, if in November the Democrats will win um, and Israel does annex the territories? Do you think that there will be any change from the new government, new administration? Uh, I'll answer the question in just a second. I just want to follow up, if you don't mind, on, on your uh, please, uh, please, question, feel free. Vivian, uh, which was uh, about sort of the interesting voices of opposition to the annexation plan from the right or from portion, at least a portion of the seller community. And, you know, right. one of the things they say, I think it's one of their main arguments is that, uh, you know, they reject the Trump plan because it only, uh, because it, it actually talks about a two-state solution. It actually talks about a Palestinian state. Now I would say what it describes is not a viable Palestinian state, even if it were to come into being. And I don't even think it will ever have a chance of being implemented. I think the only thing it, it actually will implement is the is the unilateral annexation. But they say it says the words two state solution, it says the words Palestinian state. We reject that in principle in any portion uh, of uh, the the land in question. And uh, they they so they oppose it. Now then there's this interesting thing happening from how the Israeli government talks about uh, the Israeli ambassador, a friend of mine in Washington, uh, just published an article in the Washington Post over the weekend that said in English. Uh, this is the realistic two-state solution. The Trump plan and the annexation are part of a realistic two-state solution, more realistic than Olmert's or Obama's or, or Barack's or, or any of the previous proposals. But this one's a realistic two-state solution, but it was very clear that that was what was being described. 
But in Israel, where I also am, although I'm not Israeli, uh, in Hebrew, uh, the prime minister and all the other ministers of the government, they never use the words Palestinian state. They never use the words two-state solution. In fact, they openly say, no, no, the only part of this we're talking about is annexation, not the rest of the Trump plan. Uh, and to the settlers raising these objections, they actually say, this is a little softer, they say it, don't worry, there's not going to be any Palestinian state. That's not what's being envisioned here. So I do think there's some a certain kind of a double talk there about what we're hearing in Hebrew, what we're hearing in English, what we're what is being said to two different audiences, uh, and so I think that's that's uh, that's concerning. Uh, actually, ironically, one of the um, uh, maybe the silver lining for me about the Trump plan is that for the first time he did use the concept of two-state solution. I think it's a very twisted yeah. version of it, but at least rhetorically he did use it. Um, and in fact, uh, while this may not be intention, I don't think the Trump plan is going to survive long. Uh, beyond the Trump administration, but by acknowledging that that is the framework, two stage, it does create an opening for a Democratic administration, whether that's in six months or four and a half years, to come in and say, yeah, we are still committed to two states. There was never any doubt about that. Now let's talk about what the borders are. Now let's talk about what the security arrangements are. Now let's talk about the sovereignty and even sovereignty limitations, obviously, in terms of demilitarization in other ways on the Palestinian state. But let's get back to talking about what well, they would say, and you know, that administration would say is the actual realistic two-state solution. It won't look exactly like the Trump plan. It may not look exactly like some of those previous uh, efforts, but it's probably somewhere uh, in, in, in between. And as to what a Biden administration would do, I think it's really hard to speculate because there are so many uh, different uh, details about whether it's going to be a 30% annexation or just the blocks or just the Jordan Valley or I think they're all problematic. I don't think uh, we should assume that one smaller annexation is better than a bigger annexation, but it, describing how a future administration will address it was very hypothetical and fact dependent. So I'm, I'm not gonna speculate on that. I will just say the vice president's been very clear that he opposes unilateral annexation. Uh, that's the view of the entire party uh, and that he would oppose it as, prime, as pre president and that he would definitely try to re-engage at least means of keeping two states alive and viable and discouraging unilateral acts by either side, uh, that would make that harder. Uh, and this obviously falls into that category. What exact steps he would undertake, I won't speculate about. Can I, I just want to make a, sorry, go ahead. Just briefly oh. respond. Uh, you hear from many Democrats, I'm a Democrat, you hear from many Democrats that the plan proposes a Palestinian state, remember the Americans use that term, and the ambassador and others say it's not a viable state. I would urge everybody to compare the map of what a Palestinian state would look like under the Trump plan with the map of what the Israeli state looked like in 1947 when the General Assembly of the United Nations divided the land into two states, one for the Jewish people, one for the Arab people. The Israeli state was non-contiguous along the coast there was no connection to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not the capital of Israel. It was an international area along with Bethlehem. It was a tiny sliver of a state, the majority of which was the Negev, which was uh -huh. basically uninhabited. Uh, and there was opposition among members of the Jewish councils who lived in Israel to accepting the partition plan. But the Israeli leadership not only accepted that partition plan, but they accepted the previous partition plan of the Peel Commission, which was even smaller and even less contiguous. The Palestinians can clearly create a viable state with mm -hmm. the, with, you know, they may need a few bypass highways. So you have to, from when you go to Ramallah to Jerusalem, you got to go 13 minutes out of the way. That's a barrier to statehood. You know, Ben-Gurion wanted a state at any cost. If the Palestinians want a state as badly as the Jews wanted a state in 1948, they should accept or at least sit down and negotiate this plan. If they sit down and negotiate, A, they're going to get more. B, they're going to get land swaps, including an incredibly important land swap in the Negev Desert. They'll get an opportunity in the future to have the Afula Triangle if there were a vote by the Arab residents of the Afula Triangle to become part of the Palestinian state. So I categorically and adamantly reject the notion that the Trump plan does not permit for a viable Palestinian state. Palestinians learn the lesson of the Israelis, accept the state as it's offered, and then 
sit down and negotiate, you will do better. But if you I know fight, Vivian wants to do worse. I know Vivian wants to get a word in. I'll just briefly respond, just to say that, you know. Yeah, she really the, does. <laughs> once the unilateral, once the taboo on unilateral acts is ripped off, which would be the case in this, uh, in this annexation plan, uh, the Palestinians may have their own unilateral measures, uh, like a unilateral declaration of independence. Maybe that's what, what they would respond with. I don't think the United States would or should re re uh, recognize in that situation, but a lot of European countries probably would consider it. And what you could then have, and maybe some future administration, I'm not uh, expecting it in the near term, but might say, look, what we have are two states, both recognized, but there's a border dispute between them. So let's negotiate those borders. But the idea that uh, Israel would have any uh, legitimacy to the claim of the borders that would be set unilaterally right now, I think is just not, uh, there's not, it's not borne out by anything we know about, about attitudes in the international community. I think that um, this notion that there's Palestinian leadership that somehow represents a unified or even, you know, cohesive view, remotely cohesive view is wrong, um, including with the PA. So, you know, your starting point or the, the starting point is very, very blurry and very murky from my perspective. Um, I'm not sure who is going to step up and declare a state unilaterally on the Palestinian side. And anyone who does uh, in today's uh, landscape is going to immediately be contending with uh, a lot of competition. So just wanted to sort of deal with that uh, quickly. The other thing, a point I want to make is Professor, Professor Dershowitz, one of the fabulous things that, and this did surprise me, um, I think it was around election three when um, there was talk about uh, returning the triangle to the Pal a Palestinian state, tremendous, tremendous disagreement among the Arab Israeli okay. residents of the triangle. They didn't want, we're not going to Jordan, we're not going to Palestinian state, we're staying right where we are. And uh, their champion being um, none other than, of course, you know, Ahmed Tibi, who right. sits as an MK and um, has lots of interesting things to say about the state of Israel. But, you know, when push comes to shove, uh, there are tremendous advantages to being an Israeli citizen and receiving the benefits of Israeli citizenship. Um, I wanted to also address, uh, it's a bit of a, I, I'm, kind of jumping around a bit, but I think these are important points. Um, when Dan, you mentioned, and I think it's a very important point, the sort of double speak that uh, we deal with in Israel uh, between the Hebrew and the English um, and what's said. And it's a point well taken and it's always been there, but it's nothing compared to the double speak in the Arab press, including the UAE, including Saudi, yeah, we always complained um, about it. I know. That's yeah, I'm I sure know, you did. I but I want to make the point, not for your benefit. I know you're well aware, but I think that this might be something that would be interesting to people who are actually tuning in. Um, and in the PA press, of course. Um, number one, none of them are even remotely free, as we know. But the vitriol, the anti-Semitic and anti-Israel vitriol that is published in the media in the PA, in the Arab countries that we're talking about, including the UAE, right. is absolutely beyond the pale. So again, I come back to, you know, yeah, the, of course the Europeans are gonna be against anything Israel does. I mean, that's just not news. But, you know, we have to, and I think that Trump and the Trump proposal and the Trump approach is the first that really tries to do this, is to be tough, is to say there is a line. And another thing that I would like to see happening is for the UAE with their leadership, am I frozen? Um, is for the UAE to stop the double talk, for the PA to stop the double talk. And what everyone has to do at a minimum, is they have to say, I mean, UAE and Saudi too, we recognize the right of Israel to exist. Even just give us the 67 borders for now, okay? And it's legitimacy as a Jewish state, number one. Number two, right of return for all Palestinian refugees isn't feasible, it's gotta be dropped. Stop the double talk, stop pretending Israel's going away and get to the table. 
those are the things that need to be done. The more we continue to pursue this idea of the idyllic two states um, and then getting everything overnight, it's not pragmatic, it's not gonna happen. I agree with Professor Dershowitz, start small, baby steps, take what you can get, show that you can run a proper state, engage in nation building um, enterprises right. and efforts, not destructive things. Paying terrorists to blow up buses and schools is not nation building, it's not. Feeding this, you know, hope that every Palestinian with a key around their neck is going to return to their ancestral home is not nation building any more than I'm going to return to, you know, where my parents came from and my grandparents came from. So everybody has to step up. And I think, you know, Professor Dershowitz quoted, uh, um, you know, the late uh, Prime Minister Robin. And I was thinking before we began tonight about uh, Begin, Prime Minister Begin. And the approach always seems to be to come and threaten Israel. Oh, you know, if you don't do this, here's what's going to happen. I've never seen the Palestinians be held to account. And you remember that great comment of Begin's um, when he said to Senator Biden, as he then was, you know, I'm not, I'm not some fearful Jew. Don't come and threaten me that you're going to take away my aid. Now, you know, because I come from a proud and very established culture with deep roots. I have 3,700 years of history. Um, it was, you know, one of those Begin-esque moments. It was great. It gave you shivers. Um, and it was very poetic. But I think that the world really has to adjust to an Israel that is strong, that is proud, that has tried hard, and that isn't going to back down because of threats, constant threats. Alan, before you comment on uh, Vivian's words, if you have any, um, what do you think about the reaction of the International Criminal Court? Do you think that uh, Israelis will be uh, threatened by uh, charges of war crimes if they do annex the uh, territories? Well, the threats of uh, war crimes already persist. I mean, already the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has said that Israelis are subject to the jurisdiction of the court, even though they're not a signatory to the Rome Treaty, even though the Palestinians are not a state with acceptable borders, for what they've done in the past, for uh, Malay Adumim and Gilo, and for uh, the war in, in Gaza. I have to tell you, I was a strong supporter of the International Criminal Court. Uh, the original prosecutor, uh, uh, Ocampo, is a wonderful, wonderful, neutral, objective man. Um, I am, and I wanted the United States to sign on. And as you know, Israel was prepared to sign on and it didn't sign on right. because the United States wasn't signing on. I'm now a strong opponent of that court. And I make a prediction here. If the International Criminal Court indicts Israel, it will be the end of the International Criminal Court, not the end of Israel, the end of the International Criminal Court. It will lose its legitimacy. What we're seeing is race-based right. affirmative action by the International Criminal Court. Here's what's happening. They have been criticized for going after primarily black, black African countries. Uh, and their new prosecutor was appointed primarily to indict some white countries. Of course, they picked a brown country, not a white country. They picked a country that has black citizens, brown citizens, white citizens, one of the most diverse uh, ethnic countries in the world. And when I debated at Oxford University, I threw out the following challenge. I said to the assembled group, many of whom are anti-Israel, I want you to stand up or even shout out the name of any country in the world faced with threats comparable to those faced by Israel, externally, internally, terrorism, Iran, name a country in the world faced with comparable threats that has a better record of human rights, higher compliance with the rule of law, and more concern for the lives of enemy civilians. Not a single person in that audience was prepared to even shout out the name of a country until, as a joke, a student in the back said, Iceland, of course, which has <laughs> 900 years. And so when the International Criminal Court goes after a country with one of the best human rights records in the world, doesn't go after Brazil, doesn't go after Venezuela, doesn't go after Iran, doesn't go after China, doesn't go after uh, Syria, doesn't go after, you name it. 
when a country that may be 199th on the list of 230 countries that have any legitimate basis, and when you have a concept in the International Criminal Court that you don't have jurisdiction if the country at issue has its own judicial system that is a responsible judicial system, if the International Court comes after Israel, it will be the end of the International Criminal Court, period. And I have gone to yeah. work on behalf of Israel to achieve that result and to help defend Israel if they are improperly accused. Wow. Um, Dan, do you have any comments about that? You want to share your thoughts, um, especially due to the uh, steps that President Trump and um, uh, Pompeo took and announced that they are barring the entrance of the judges and the workers of the International Criminal Court into the United States, putting sanctions on them, uh, and perhaps even utilizing the Invade the Hague law. Um, I have followed the, all of the details of those decisions uh, closely. I share a lot of uh, Professor Dershowitz's criticisms of the court and its uh, 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 focus on Israel or attempts to use it uh, to go after Israel. And, and during the Obama administration, we frequently were in dialogue and sometimes it was not always a, such a friendly dialogue uh, with the sure. court to uh, try to ensure that it didn't happen and it didn't happen uh, during those years. That's true. Um, so I, you know, I, I don't disagree about the, the fundamental needs there. I, I'm not sure I, I have a few on the on these steps that were taken recently. I think the court could potentially play a useful uh, role in this world. And uh, I'm not sure, uh, you know, we want to see it disappear, but it needs to function well and it needs to make good choices. And uh, Professor Schwitz is right about many of the uh, very glaring cases where it hasn't had anything to say, where, where if it's going to act in have legitimacy, it probably should. I will respond to just a couple other points that came up. I mean, I think all three of us may have in different ways slightly uh, spoken about the uh, uh, desirability to keep uh, some hope of a two-state solution alive and, and achievable, uh, entice the Palestinians to come or tell them uh, that they will lose a more if they don't come. Um, I, we'd probably disagree on whether the Trump plan or the annexation scheme would uh, actually help do that. Um, but I think that goal is something that uh, is interesting that we all sort of share. One of the things I think we should be aware of is that the trend among younger Palestinians is not toward two states. It's quite the opposite. The trend among younger Palestinians, uh, people under 40, uh, is really to reject that model. Uh, they blame their own leadership for its failings. They certainly also uh, blame Israel. Uh, but they are generally focused on, on uh, politics so much. They're not focused on achieving a two-state solution. They think that train has already uh, long since left the station. And they say, you know, we'll, we'll work on our, our lives, we'll work on our careers, work on our families. And over time, we will demand uh, simply uh, the rights of citizenship, one state uh, between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. And that's what we will seek. Uh, and, uh, you know, it would take a strong Palestinian leader to come back and bring the Palestinian leaders who we don't see on the horizon today, I have to acknowledge, who would be able to say to their own people, that's not the path for us. The path for us is two states, but also uh, without the myth of a right of return and without uh, the uh, delegitimization of Israel, the things that have not been done heretofore. Mm -hmm. But we're certainly not going to make it easier uh, for such a Palestinian leader to come and, and uh, try to reorient their people back toward that form of two states that, uh, that we want to see if uh, it doesn't look viable, if it doesn't look achievable, and the, and the rising trend is to say, you know what, we'll just adapt to the reality, which is one authority uh, between the Jordan and the Mediterranean, and we simply want the rights of citizenship uh, like everybody else. And I think that's the reason, I think, I, I don't think, I know that's the reason that Prime Minister Netanyahu told me on many occasions when I was ambassador that he does not, was not for annexation. In fact, he used to tell me about how much he would argue with other members of his party who were advocates for annexation because the risk of Israel becoming a binational state was too great uh, right. and he wanted to avoid it. He had all sorts of very creative, I think, proposals about way of Israel could achieve its security needs in the Jordan Valley without applying Israeli sovereignty, a long-term presence and, 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 and many other means, uh, but they didn't ever go to sovereignty. It wasn't until uh, a, a year ago, April, about a week before the April 2019 election, that for the first time he became an advocate for annexation. You know, is that because of Trump? Is that because of his political needs? I don't know. But that's a rather startling shift 
in strategic terms. And the mm -hmm. last thing I'll just say is that, you know, we still don't even know what we're talking about here, right? Nobody right. has seen a map. I mean, we've seen the Trump conceptual map, which is a kind of Swiss cheese sort of scenario, but it's not going to happen. But nobody has seen a map of what's being discussed. The, the IDF clearly has been doing scenario planning against all sorts of different scenarios because no one has shown them a map or consulted with them on the security uh, dimensions of this. Um, and every day in the Israeli press, you read multiple contradictory stories. It's going to be the full 30%. It's going to be even more than that because some settlers complain that's not enough. It's going to be just the Jordan Valley. It's going to be the blocks. It's going to be the outlying settlements. It's going to be some combination of those. Nobody has any idea what this is going to be. And we could, as early as July 1st, have a decision put forward on that. That is a very strange way to make a decision that could have major strategic, societal, and national security consequences for the state of Israel. I worry about that as an American because I think it's harmful to Israel's security and its future as a Jewish and democratic state and the values-based partnership partner that we've always had. Uh, and I would prefer to see decisions being made with a much better strategic uh, approach than what seems to be going on right now. I would, yeah. I would amen that. I want to just pick up very quickly on one point you made, Dan, that I think is really important, you know, which is that if things carry on the way they seem to be, that that's not going to be terribly helpful in terms of cultivating moderate leadership that may actually come to the table in a constructive way. And Professor, Professor Dershowitz mentioned earlier the appalling borders in, were presented to Israel in the petition plan, both in the Peel Commission and then in the 47 petition plan. And the Jews were desperate. You know, Ben-Gurion would say, as you said, uh, Professor, Ben-Gurion needed and wanted and would accept a Jewish state almost on any terms. And, you know, as we were talking, I was thinking, well, maybe if it looks like the sand is starting to run out of the hourglass, that's precisely the time that if there is some kernel of moderate, pragmatic Palestinian leadership that hasn't yet been run out of town, that that's the moment for them to step up and say, holy cow, we're running out of time here. This isn't working. You guys have had 50 plus years to show your stuff. Let, you know, and somehow manages in a not liberal, liberal democratic society to bring about, to show, to lead and to get people to the table. So I thought I'd offer that as, you know, a little ray of hope in all of this, because God knows and there's lots to bark about and complain about and be pessimistic about. But maybe that somebody will step up and say, we're desperate. We need a state. We need it under whatever terms we can negotiate now. And let's show our stuff and let's behave like people who want a state. Look, I had a lot of agreement here tonight and I think if we could eliminate some so label, beautiful. there would be considerable agreement. What worries me is that the Democratic Party, which I have been a member of all of my adult life, is moving hard, hard left without regard to what Israel does. And what worries me is that the word annexation and the plan, which I hope is not carried out, uh, will give other Democrats who don't know what they're talking about, most of these congressmen and senators wouldn't have any idea what the West Bank looks like or what the difference is between 30% and 20%. They just vote emotionally. And uh, what I worry about is the bipartisan consensus could be uh, hurt by this. Look, I think we have a struggle. Um, I think Dan and I are on the same side of this. We have a struggle for the heart and soul of the Democratic Party in general, when it comes to support for Israel. When you get even Elizabeth Warren, who was my colleague for 30 years at Harvard, and when I called her on the phone and I said, you cannot refuse to listen to Benjamin Netanyahu speak in Congress about the Iran plan. And she said, I'm not gonna go and listen to him. I said, you'd listen to Castro, you'd listen to the head of China, you'd probably listen to the head of Iran, but you, Elizabeth Warren, senator from Massachusetts, are not going to listen to the prime minister of our strongest ally. I said, for me, Liz, that's a red line. You can never again count on my support. And then I had a call with Congressman Rangel, uh, who was not going to go. And I said, Congressman Rangel, go and listen. Otherwise, this will be seen as a black Jewish issue because you're one of the leaders of the Black Caucus. And he said, Alan, for you, I'll do it. 
And he went and then he called me afterward and said, what a great speech that was. I disagreed with a lot of it and I'm going to have a press conference, but I'm glad you persuaded me to go. But you get, even at that point in time, Al Franken, Liz Warren, so many Democrats refusing to listen to Benjamin Netanyahu's speech. There is a drift away from support for the Democratic Party among young Democrats. And that drift's going to continue no matter what Israel does. And as I've said over and over again, Israel should care deeply about America, but it should care more deeply about doing the right thing for its citizens. I completely agree with Menachem Begin. Israel will no longer be cowed or told what to do for fear of what some American congressmen may misinterpret and may do. If it can act in its own national interest and maintain the support, that's the better thing to do. But it, it is a sovereign country that must make its own decisions. Look, there's a wonderful, I don't want to invoke the Bible, I'm not a, I'm a secular Jew. But the wonderful phrase in the book of Psalms, Hashem oz li'amo yitain, God will give the Jewish people strength. Hashem yivarech et amo b'shalom. The Jewish people will get peace only through strength. We have seen that prove throughout history. Weak Jews with morality on their side end up in gas chambers. Strong Jews end up fighting back. Sometimes that strength requires compromise, obviously. Sometimes it requires standing up to Americans, standing up to the Europeans, but in the end, Israel should do what it thinks is the right thing. Its constituency is the Israelis, the Israeli Arabs, the Israeli Christians, the Israeli Jews, Israeli Ethiopians, Israeli Russians, the most diverse, heterogeneous country in the world. It has to do its best for its own citizens. And uh, with these strong words, I would like to conclude this panel. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I would like to thank you so much. It was a fascinating discussion. Uh, we got so many response from the user, from the followers on every media, YouTube, Facebook, amazing. Um, and it indeed was very, very enlightening. So, um, Thank you, Ambassador Dan Shapiro. Thank you, Professor Alan Dershowitz. And thank you so much, Vivian Berkovici. Thank you for coming and joining us. Thank you. It was an honor. An honor to be a good panel. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for convening it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good night. Good night. I would like to encourage everyone who is interested in the work of Shurat Adin again to go on our website, israelawcenter.org, sign up for our mailing list and follow up on Twitter and Facebook too. I hope everyone found this program educational, fascinating, enjoyable as I did. As you know, uh, Shurat Adin Israel Law Center is entirely funded by the generous donations of our supporters worldwide. Our funding comes from private individuals and foundations who believe in Shuradin's mission and are amazed by our unprecedented legal successes. We fight on behalf of the terror victims and others who have no one else to stand up for them. Please become a Shuradin partner. Like everyone, our law center was badly financially injured by the pandemic, by the COVID-19, unfortunately, the struggle against the terror groups and rogue regimes must continue on. We hope you will consider us in your charitable giving so we may continue to fight back. Thank you very much for joining us on this online conference. Please stay safe in these challenging times.